Asset allocation is the delicate balance of stocks, bonds, and other assets that make up your investment portfolio. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 347, Joe and Big Al help YMYW listeners figure out the best asset allocations for their needs. What's a good mix of domestic and international stocks? Is a 90-10 stock bond mix crazy in a $10 million portfolio? Can pension and social security count as your bond allocation? And should dad's portfolio be rebalanced from 90% stocks to 60% stocks and 40% bonds? Then for something completely different, we'll wrap up with a legacy tax planning question. How do you avoid confiscatory estate taxes? Go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click on Ask Joe and Al on air to send in your money questions and comments. And don't forget to tell us where you're from, where and when you listen, and what you're drinking. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. We got, hi, Joe, Big Al, and Andy, YMYW is the best. I never miss an episode. Wow. Committed. That is impressive. (laughs) Uh, More pathetic. (laughs) (laughs) You don't say that to a, a fan. A dedicated that's, listener. That's, that's impressive. I have a simple non-Roth question. I've determined that a 70-30 allocation is right for my risk tolerance. I'm not sure how to split the 70% between domestic and international. When I research this on the web, the answers are all over the map from 50-50 to 100-0. What's a reasonable mix? I'm thinking about 30% bonds, cash equivalents, 50% domestic stocks, 20% international. Does this make sense? Okay. And he signed it, Brian, in Albany, New York. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Here's, you look at two different things here. Uh, Brian is my two cents. Okay. Is that if he believes that 70-30 is the appropriate mix, then you look at your bond allocation. And so what kind of bonds do you want to hold in your 30% bond allocation? Um. He, he just says bonds and cash equivalents. So right. is that short-term bonds, long-term bonds, high yield bonds, corporate bonds, treasuries? You know, so you want to get a little bit more allocation there. Is there tips in there? There's all sorts of different flavors and bonds. Yeah. Um, so if 30% is the bond equation, just make sure that you understand what type of bonds that you own in them. The stock component. Um, you break this out probably into different sectors, right? So he wants to first know international versus domestic. Right. You can look at like the global market capitalization, I guess. You know, so when you look, um, most people are home biased. Sure. So they have more money in domestic stocks than they do in foreign stocks. Yeah. And are you okay with it? I'm fine with that. Yeah, I think okay. they're missing out on some some pretty good out, um, diversification. Yeah. Well, I think they you everyone should have an international stock allocation, which uh, which Brian has. So so that's a, that's a great start. I think our allocation is sixty um, percent in domestic, forty percent international. That's exactly right. So on on just the stock side, right? So bonds separate. If you look at your stocks, what we do for our clients is sixty percent. Uh, domestic 40% international. I, I personally, I, I kind of like to think maybe two thirds ish, right. In domestic one third, but it doesn't, it doesn't really, it, it, as long as you have some allocation and understand that the markets tend to, that they're, they go up and down somewhat in tandem, but not completely. I mean, we've had decades where the U S has done terrible and international has done great and vice versa. Right. That's why you actually have some of each because they, they tend to peak at different times. We're in one of those decades now where, where U S has done great. Right. And international's leg. Right. Which generally then would mean maybe there's more opportunity in international. But as I say that, I cringe because <laughs> you never know. Right. We could have another decade where U.S. outperforms. We just don't know. But, but the issue is, is that do you want that type of portfolio? Because right. here's what you're going to compare your portfolio to. You're going to compare it to the S&P 500, and then you're going to look at your portfolio, and it's either going to outperform or lag the S&P 500 because yeah. you have a good comp- portion of your portfolio in A, bonds, 30% of it, and also international stocks. So your benchmark is going to be off, and then you're going to make moves, and you're going to do changes potentially to the portfolio because you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. Well, that's a good point. So we in the industry call that tracking error. In other words, you're, you're not tracking to the U.S. Uh, indices, which is what you see. 
right? And if, and what you hear, right? And and so if you feel like you're going to have an issue with there, maybe you have less international, just so you have less tracking error, right? Um, you also want to make sure in your international stock component, you have emerging markets. Agreed. Right. So then what is the actual split? I think you look at, so you, you block it off into the easiest way to do it is that you look at your bond component, even though that's 30% of your bond or 30% of the portfolio block right. it off to say, all right, here's my bond component. I want 50% in short-term bonds, 50% in cash. Right. Here's my stock component. I want 60% in equity or um, US. I want 40% in international. Right. From the international, maybe you want 70% in international stocks in 30% in emerging markets. Yeah, I like that. Right. And then you break it out even more. So you can kind of see this pyramid building. Right. Then you're going to look at what kind of stocks do you want to own? Do you want to own value stocks? How much of your percentage do you want to have in value type stocks versus growth stocks, small company stocks versus large company stocks, right? So this is how the, you know, building a portfolio construction, you know, 101. And I think he's on to a good start here, but there's a lot more layers to the cake, if you will, that, that you want to consider. Yeah. And the interesting thing, Joe, is that, that these different asset classes, they don't all perform the same, right? So for example, large company growth stocks have outperformed generally over the last five years. Everything. Yeah. Because right. you have your Amazon, right. you have right. Alphabet, you have Tesla, you have Netflix, you have yeah. Google. Nevertheless, since last fall, small companies have started slightly outperforming large companies. And uh, why is that? Maybe it's been the cycle that we're in, maybe. right? We just got out of a pandemic and then maybe these smaller companies that got really hurt are now coming back. Who knows? We, right. we, we can't predict the future. Right. We can always look in the past and look at performance. And we've known over the past hundred years that smaller companies have outperformed larger companies because there's more risk. Right. Right. Smaller companies are doomed to uh, like a half of them are doomed to fail. Right. Because of that, the other half are going to outperform, which will be compensated for the risk that you're taking there. Otherwise, no one would invest in them. So they, it's, they by definition, they better perform better. <laughs> you have to get paid now, for the risk you're now, taking. Now, now, here's the problem, though. It doesn't happen every year. It doesn't happen five years, sometimes 10 years in a row. It doesn't happen. But when you look back 100 years, small companies have beat large companies. And when you look back 100 years, value companies have beat growth companies. That's not been true the last five years plus, but... That has been true historically. So just food for thought as you're constructing your overall portfolio, I guess, you know, uh, I think there's uh, I, the point of the discussion is um, I'm glad you're thinking about international versus domestic, but you could, you should be taking this a little bit deeper. Sure. So uh, it says, hi, Andy. Uh, first, not last. Uh, Big Al and Dy Dynamic. Dynamic or Dynamito. Well, Dynamite Joe. <laughs> Dynamite Joe. Um, I'm in sunny Arizona, and this is my first email to you. Well, thank you for the email. I'm 65 years old, quit working in 2017, while well, wife, 60, has been a homemaker since day one. Found you by searching best retirement podcast. Nice. Oh, it makes, we made some kind of list. And we came up? Apparently. <laughs> okay. How about that? We were Remember, we are the, funny, the best podcast with humor, according to, uh, I think it was a financial... Physician guy? Yeah, it was a group of doctors, right? Yeah. I remember that. Uh, typically listen while on walks and started with episode 250. What, what episode <laughs> are we on now? Uh, this one is 347. Ooh. All right. Well, I guess if you do one a day, maybe you double up some. It's been listening for two months. It, yeah. It up. Wow. I have enjoyed each segment and must admit that I admire your knowledge, tenacity, and patience. Um, I listen at one and a half times speed. Really? And increase it to two times when the same question is being answered. Think back to a Roth. Yeah, we have answered <laughs> that one a lot. He goes to two times. Two times. I like it. There's, so is you there guys sound times? like chipmunks. Yeah. Maybe, maybe four times. I wonder how we sound at two times. Probably not. <laughs> not great. So my question is, my expenses over 10 years are estimated to be a million dollars. If I have two and a half million dollars in assets, then for a 60 40 portfolio, 1.5 is equities, a million cash and bonds. However, if my assets are 10 million, then a 60 40 portfolio would result in 6 million in equities, 40 million in cash. Four would million. I be, four million, I'm sorry. Would I be crazy to keep nine million in equities and one million in cash, a 90 10 mix for a $10 million portfolio? 
This strategy would be to maintain 10 years of expenses in cash all the time. Goal is to leave some bucks to charity and kids. Three kids who are doctors, um, so well settled. Would love to hear your thoughts. Keep up the good work. Best regards, Sunny D. Okay, I'm a little confused on Sonny D's question here. Does well, he have? I think he's got ten million. I, I think he's got ten million, but he's just trying to get there by saying we might say that he should have ten years in safety. But what if he has a lot of money? Does can he do a ninety ten allocation? Okay, so if he's spending a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Oh no, um, my expenses yeah. over ten. Yeah, no, that's years. right. 10 years, 100,000 a year. Okay, so he wants to spend $100,000 a year. And so how we would look at that is to say, all right, well, you might want to have 10 years of very safe money. Yeah. So 10 so times $100,000 is a million bucks. You want to have at least a million, but that, that's only one way to figure out what the allocation should be. He's got $2.5 million in assets. So if you look at two and a half millions, uh, one million and two and a half, that's a kind of a 60, 40 split. Yeah. And that, that looks good. But if, it, but it, what if it grows to 10 million, <laughs> then what? I think that's the question. Right. Well, yeah. If you wanted to have that same rule of thumb and same thought process, then you would want a million dollars sitting in cash that would cover your living expenses for the next 10 years. The other nine million uh, w- would grow. There's never been a time where a globally diversified portfolio went down in value over ten years. That's not saying it can't happen. Sure. Uh, but as history looks, it's it's pretty hard um, unless we go through a, a really bad ten year right. period. Yeah. So, and I I would say I would say a couple th- I'll add a couple things to that. So one way to figure out your allocation is to look at your goals and figure out what rate of return you need for the portfolio. And then you can sort of work backwards to figure out how much you should have in stocks versus bonds. If, if stocks, let's just say stocks earn over time, eight or 9% and bonds earn two or three, you, you know, kind of just do the math to figure it out. Right. And of course those, those numbers change. <laughs> so don't take that as gospel, but that would be one approach. But I, I might say, um, uh, Sonny, I might say that I would ask you, how did you, um, respond during the great recession because the stock market went down about 50 percent so if you had 90 percent so nine million dollars just to say an example and if that nine million dollars got cut in half so if you lost four and a half million dollars are you are you okay with that could you ride out the storm some people can i would say most can't that's a pretty that's a tough ask and so you kind of have to figure out your risk that that's another way to think about this is risk tolerance um, I'm not saying the market's going to drop 50%, but it did in 2008. So it could happen again. So here's Alan's what, if, if I look at it, um, let me see if I, if I got this right. <laughs> so you can look at what expected rate of return does Sonny need to make? Well, he's right. spending a hundred thousand dollars a year. So that's 1% of the portfolio that at least that he needs to make to I'll pay inflation and taxes. Yeah. Maybe two and a half percent is what his, his rate of return needs to be. Yeah. So that's probably what 90% bonds, 10% stocks. Yeah. Maybe a hundred percent bonds. Or, or, like, or, if you think of it that way. Yeah. So, so there is an argument if you don't need to take the risk, why, why take, take the risk? It? But the problem with that is you may not even keep up with inflation. And if your goal is to pass more to the kids into charity, you, you probably want some growth. So then on the total other side of that, you look at to say, you know what? I want a hundred thousand dollars a year plus tax, plus a cost of living, you know, so maybe I need a million dollars just sitting in cash. I could care less what happens to the market over the next sure. n- next 10 years. I know for certain that I have a guaranteed yeah. income over the next 10 years and we'll see what happens to the market. Yeah. And, and as long as you can stomach that some people can, many cannot. Right. Right. I, I agree. But I would, it, if, if you could say, you know what, I know I'm fine. I could ride this thing out. I think that helps if you have a plan, if it, you have a strategy. It, it helps a lot. And if you're tax managing the portfolio, if you're rebalancing the portfolio, and when that market does come back, right. you're going to own a lot more shares. You're going to have a, a um, you, you know, some tax benefits along the way where a down market could actually help you quite a bit long term. Right. If you stay the course and manage the, the, the portfolio correctly. Yeah. Here's another thought, Sonny. You are feeling a little older today. You're so conservative. Yeah, I am, right? <laughs> so uh, so Sonny is uh, married and 
So here's, <laughs> you may be risk adverse is your wife. Is she willing to do this? Or right your husband. You? Yeah. Or husband. Yeah. Either one. Well, so anyway, I think make sure both of you are on the same page. That, that would be, in my particular case, I'm willing to take more risks than my lovely wife. And that's just the, the reality of it. Sure. So, yeah. Um, How many times have we seen couples come in and husband or wife made a poor decision and they get hit over the head by the, right. the other one? Yeah. And, and what happened was the market cratered, the one spouse got panicked and they sold and so they locked in their losses so they didn't write it down right well yeah i i think one spouse typically deals with the finances while the other spouse maybe doesn't necessarily care for it right and until until the market blows up you lose half your investment yeah (laughs) and then it's like what are you doing you know we got to stop this now and then you sell and then you're sitting on the sidelines so right it could be a happy medium for sunny It, it could be but 90-10, 90% 90-10, 90% stocks, 10% bonds is fine. As long as you understand there's going to be periods of extreme volatility where you're not going to be happy. Sure. You could go through the last decade. You could. Right? Right. And so what was that, 2000 through 2010-ish? Yep. Where the S&P 500 was flat. Yeah. Uh, even down. Down yeah. about 9%, right? Well, it wasn't down nine. Was it down that? Yeah, it was a million dollar portfolio oh, for a total total, total return total, total for return. ten years, so one percent per year. One percent per year on a, yeah on an annualized basis. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, 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 sure. So yeah, if you you had ten million dollars, it's going to be worth nine million ten years from now. Yeah, that's what happened in the last two thousand to two thousand ten. Right, because if you remember, right, we had the dot com bust. You had nine right. eleven. You had all sorts of you know the Great Recession. But yeah. but I think this is an important point. That's what happened if you only own the S and P five hundred. If you had a globally diversified portfolio with international funds, emerging markets, you actually did. Six percent. Correct. Well, you doubled your money. Yeah, right. Basically. Yeah, just about. So then that nine million is now worth 18 million. Yeah, almost. Right. So that's that's one of the benefits of diversifying. The 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 great thing about not diversifying is if you pick the right fund at the right time. But But, but that's hard to do. Exactly. And the more money that you have, it's really difficult to do this too. Right. Right. Because if the market corrects 10% on 10 million. (laughs) It's a, lot. A, it's a big number versus if you correct 10% on a hundred thousand. I could just see that already with Annie. Honey, you just lost us a million. We'll, we'll get big. Yeah. We got 10 mil, dude. <laughs> I, I said, if I had that. Oh, wow. So anyway, great question. Thanks, Sunny D. Learn more about asset allocation by taking advantage of all the free resources I've posted in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. The Retirement Readiness Guide contains eight strategies, one of which focuses on asset allocation to help you prepare for retirement. YMYW podcast episode 262 was about asset allocation. That's in the podcast show notes too. And there's also an in-depth blog post that fleshes out asset allocation in much more detail and shows how it has the potential to lower your risk while giving you the same expected return. There are a lot of moving parts to constructing a properly allocated retirement portfolio and a financial assessment with a certified financial planner professional on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors can help. It's free, just like the podcast and those financial resources, and you can schedule yours right in the podcast show notes as well. Just click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to get to those free resources and to schedule your free financial assessment. All right. We got uh, James. He writes in from Arizona. Hello, Joe, Alan, Andy. Thanks for the podcast and the valuable information you share with us listeners. I would like to get your thoughts on how to incorporate a pension in social security within fixed income portion of my portfolio. All right. Do you recommend this approach or do you keep those separate from the allocation percentages? Uh, So James is asking now, is that, all right, well, I got a pension and social security. Can I just count that as like my bond allocation in my portfolio? Yeah. So in other words, I don't need any bonds, right? Because I got plenty of fixed income. Correct. It's, right. So, is, I mean, I, I guess another way to look at that is like, um, God, what was the name of the book that, um, that he was all into human capital and he kind of looked at it that way. If you have, you know, fixed income sources coming in from social security and pensions and so on, you know, you have to look at that present value allocation into your overall asset allocation, right? Yes, I do remember that. I forget the name of the book too. We interviewed him, the author, I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a good guy. 
As an example, we have $1.5 million in retirement in taxable accounts, and we want to take 4% each year or $60,000. My pension is 20 grand per year. Our Social Security will be $40,000 per year. That provides $120,000 in total income with half coming from pension and Social Security. If we want to have a 50-50 equity and fixed income allocation, and the 50% fixed income is covered with pension and Social Security, can we invest 100% of what is in the retirement taxable accounts into equities to cover the 50% of the portfolio. If you do not agree with this approach, I would appreciate you hearing your thoughts and how you incorporate pensions and social securities into the equity and fixed income portfolio mix. Um, much appreciated. And James, that's a very good question. And um, Al, I guess I'll let you kind of take a crack at that. So then- it's my turn. Okay, good. See what you think. I, I like to separate it, Joe. So in other words, I, I like to say, what, what is your need? What is your shortfall? You take your, your spending need of 120 and your fixed income is 60, so you still need 60. So I like to look at that compared to your overall portfolio. And of course, that's 4%. Uh, but then a couple, couple of things that I would say. Uh, one is we kind of want to make sure you have enough safety in your portfolio to ride out a long-term market downturn. So if you need 60,000 a year, you can multiply that by five years. You can multiply by 10 years. Let's say 10 years to be ultra safe, right? So that's $600,000. So if, if you, if, if you agree with that, then you would want 600,000 in fixed income divided by 1.5 million, which comes out to be 40%, 40% bonds, 60% stocks. Now, um, that's just that's one way to look at it. A second way to look at it is what rate of return do you need to be able to generate a 4% cash flow distribution? And interestingly enough, the 4% rule came from somebody investing in a 60 40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds for a 25 year period. That doesn't guarantee that's going to work, but over the likelihood, it's probably 90% plus chance that you'll have enough money over your retirement, which is was when the study was done years ago, uh, was over 25 years. So a- anyway, in both analysis, 60-40 to get a 4% distribution, 60-40 to have $600,000 in fixed income, I think that's the number. You know, um, I agree with both those statements because how I would look, I mean, you have to look at it. What is the demand for the portfolio? What is the portfolio meant to do? And the portfolio in this particular scenario for James is that it needs to create $40,000 of income, right? Is that, or or $60,000 of income from the portfolio. He'll be pulling 4% of the portfolio. So he's like, well, can I keep that 100% equity? Because my true income need is 120,000. So 60,000 is going to come from the portfolio. 60,000 is going to come from pensions and social security. So half of my income is already met by, you know, other fixed income sources other than my portfolio. So can't I just keep that hundred percent stocks because half of my income is already covered and that's my fixed income. I like his thinking. Uh, but I think it's flawed just a little bit because he has to look at what the demand is for the portfolio. Because if he's got 100% stocks and he's pulling 4% out, do we know how old James is? Uh, no, no idea. We don't. Um, I don't know. Maybe if, if he was 75, I'd be fine with it. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I think that to me, Joe, that the the lower the demand on the portfolio, now it's now you've got a little more flexibility flexibility. You can, you can take more risk if that's what you want to do to save for charity or, or your kids, or you can take less risk because you don't need to take as much risk. But I think, you know, the four, the 4% rule was originally designed as a 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And that's, that's kind of what he's wanting to do. Yeah, no, I, I agree. He needs a little bit more safety because if he had a hundred percent equities within that portfolio and he's pulling 4% out and the market drops, let's say 20%, right? And so now he doesn't have that, that 4% just went up to seven or 8% and he could go into asset depletion mode. If he's fine at the end of the day, just living off of $60,000 from his fixed income sources, um, by all means, just keep it in equities. 
because he could eventually live off of $200,000 a year if, the, if he has a really good bull run. Uh, but if Maybe. he hits a bear market at the wrong time, it could blow up his entire plan. So we're fairly yeah. conservative. So we look at constructing the portfolio of what it needs. And if you're taking that big of a distribution, um, I, I like Al's idea. Uh, Craig from Chicago writes in, you'll be glad to know that the, the word Roth, Oh, yeah, you yes. put it like, you know, yeah, like, it's a swear word. like it's swear a bad word. word. Yeah, <laughs> it's nowhere in this question. Thanks, Craig. Craig, we like you already. Craig, love you, buddy. Uh, I took over my father's finances uh, from a friend broker oh, of his who uh, my dad in was in questionable investments, MLPs, non-traded REITs, etc. So, OK, he's taking over the family finances. I guess he looked at his dad's brokerage account. He's got some uh, questionable investment choices in there. Okay. It's going to be difficult to get out of these, so I'm dealing with the IRA and brokerage accounts first. The IRA is manageable as I can get out of those bad, risky investments without any tax consequences, right? Yes. Anything <laughs> inside a retirement account, you're good to go. You can buy, sell, trade, day trade, do whatever in the retirement accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, whatever. Because they grow tax deferred, just make sure that you're doing it correctly as you transfer those money into another IRA that you're not taking distributions. We've seen that in the past. Uh, so my plan there is just to rebalance to the three fund portfolio at 60-40. Okay. Three fund portfolio. I think it's like Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, mm -hmm. Total International Index, and a bond fund. That's exactly what he's referring to. Okay. Or Fidelity or whoever. It doesn't matter. All right. Which is a, not a bad, very simple way to go. I, I agree. Um, but the brokerage account is large and 90% invested in individual stocks. I'd like to sell the bulk of the stocks and rebalance into Fidelity no-fee mutual funds, ending up at a 60-40 split. But I understand that he will have to pay taxes, at least 15%, on any gains. Do I understand this right? And is there some strategy to lessen the tax impact of a radical rebalance like this? I drive a Tesla. <laughs> Ugh, thanks, Craig. That's good. Uh, not Yes, I mean, tax loss harvesting comes to mind. But make sure that you're rebalancing just, uh, I guess, if you're going to take over the family finances, you don't want to blow them up in taxes just to make your life easier. Right. <laughs> I mean, if yeah. he's got good investments, you know, keep the ones that are good and then get rid of the ones that are bad. Yeah. I think that the way I would think about it is that some of the individual stocks probably that have a bunch of gains, maybe you, you use those as proxies for an S&P 500 fund, which is not ideal. I understand it's not as, as diversified as you would like. But if it avoids causing a whole bunch of taxation, we don't know how old your dad is. And right now, under current law, when someone passes away, the next generation gets a full step up in basis. So there is no tax problem. So if your dad is 70 and is his dad lived to 95, then that's probably not going to be a great strategy. On the other hand, if your dad's like my dad, who's 87, I mean, you hate to think about it. Wow. But, but, uh, Morbid. We, <laughs> we don't live forever. <laughs> And even he said, I, I don't know if I want to get to 90. So, <laughs> so yeah, Craig, if your dad's a tip in the toe. <laughs> well, I mean, the me. dirt nap. I've got to be oh, realistic God. here, right? Um, yeah. If you can barely fog a mirror, uh, then don't do anything. Just hold on. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, do do your best. Just just create some proxies on some of these stocks and try to backfill the best you can. Yes, um, hopefully that helps. Yeah, but you know we've seen that in the past. Like, you know, it's, I'm taking over the family finances. Dad's 90, and all of a sudden they're selling all this stuff, and capital gains happens, and, the, and they rebalance yeah. it. But then the old man dies like a couple weeks later. They could have got a full step up yeah. the basis. No taxes or, due. Or or mom's about to pass away. She sells all her real estate, so it's simpler for the kids. Yeah, and pays a bunch of tax that they wouldn't have paid. Yikes! Yes, planning for what happens when you or your parents are gone can be morbid, but these are important conversations to have and decisions to make. We have a free resource that can make it a little bit easier for everyone involved. Our estate plan organizer is packed with information to help you get your estate in order, like a list of documents to provide to your loved ones, and a convenient place to record all of the information that your family will need in the event of your passing. You download the organizer, fill out everything from your financial account details and your insurance policies to your contacts and your final wishes. Then you just put it in a safe place and give a copy to your family. And don't forget to update it regularly. 
You can download the estate plan organizer for free from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Just click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and you'll see the estate plan organizer there right under free resources. A big Texas howdy to the YMYW team, Big Al, Andy, Andy's mom, and Joe, the excitable intern. Wow. wow. How about that? Just water up a duck's back. You, know? <laughs> you got thick skin, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> this He's is, building it. He's building yeah, it. Sometimes. Well, where's Ninja, the, the crazy ninja that wants me to retire and just give up <laughs> the, the abuse I get from our right, listeners? Right. <laughs> Uh, this is George emailing again from Ledbetter, Texas. Still living my best retired life with Cletus the Wonder Dog, and I wanted to reach out with y'all to pose another question. I'm looking at legacy planning um, and find myself stumped. My wife and I each retired at 61 years old. We have a combined $13 million net worth. We know that we... Uh, we know that the United Gift and Estate Tax Exemption is currently $22 million for a married couple. And that is scheduled to get cut in half by the end of 2025. If not sooner, that puts us in a 40% estate tax crosshairs. Uh, obviously, we're trying to avoid confiscatory. Yes, estate taxes. <laughs> uh, so we can pass along our estate to our children in important charities. We've already established an irrevocable life insurance trust that holds $3 million second and I policy that pays our three children upon both our deaths. By law, that's not included in our estate. Grantor trusts appear to be on the chopping block in proposed legislation. Anything else we can do? Can the islet hold assets other than life insurance? Should we consider an additional second and I policy? Thanks for your bar stool conversation. Oh, and I was looking through my old baseball cards and stumbled on to one iron Mike Schmidt of the Phillies. I'll be honest, he does look a lot like Big Al. Do you agree, Andy? And then he says, I've dug even deeper. (laughs) He's got a picture of Joe Anderson looking just like Tom Arnold. And I believe that there is some Photoshop involved in both of these. Well, I I would agree because that's me (laughs) in a Phillies uniform. But it's cool. You did a great job. I don't know. I don't I don't get the whole Tom Arnold thing, but one listener said you look like him and I don't see it myself either. But if you if you cover up the eyes and just look at the nose and below it's in def- the face, def- well, def- because def- that is my you. nose. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's definitely you. <laughs> I think it's his whole face. I think it's Tom think Arnold's it's head with and his glasses on. But yeah, I think it's Joe's face. Yeah. It, and well, I think and I think it's Al Clopine with uh, Mike Schmidt's mustache. No, no, well, no, that's what my mustache is. Anyway, let's like. move on because dude, people can't see what the hell we're talking about. We're well, going to we're gonna put this in the podcast show notes. There. What are you talking about? Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. Well, my, my picture is more flattering than yours. We need to understand here, George's. Um, All right. So he's already giving, right, to charity. Yeah. And, and they got, and he has a second to die policy. So he's probably already doing the gifts to the kids through, through crummy trusts, right? All right. Yeah. So he's got a $13 million net worth. All right. First of all, I would want to know how much of that is in a retirement account. How much of that is in a non-qualified account? Um, from there, it's how much are you giving to charity, right? Because it, you can give to charity at your death that would avoid the exemption. Sure. You know what I mean? It's it, you're not going to get stuck with taxes there. So I think by doing at a $13 million net worth, I would not be overly concerned. That's my opinion. I don't think you got to start doing grants and crummies. You, you know, he's already got a second to die. Someone probably right. sold him that. Sure. Should he do some more life insurance? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Can, can he gift while he's living? Uh, probably can, can you wait until you pass and, and take a look at what do you want to give to charity versus what do you want to give to your family? Um, you know, cause it's going to go three ways. It's going to go to a, either taxes, your family or charity. And then you got to decide what percentage do you want to go to charity versus your family? Then that would create your overall estate plan in my, in my humble opinion. Okay. Yeah. Cause right, right now we've got almost a $12 million exemption per person. So it's not a problem today. However, in the bill that just came out with the House Ways and Means Committee on September 13th, they want they're wanting to chop it back to five million. Yeah, plus plus inflation. So call it five and a half just for per person. Yeah, per person. Right. So that's 11. So there's not it currently. And you're right, Joe. So like, let's just say um, 
George, if you want to give away $2 million to charity right now, you're fine. Because even if they go back to the $5.5 million, roughly, because that comes right off the top. But at 61 with a $13 million state, depending upon what you're spending, could that be double by the time you pass away or more? Sure. Yeah. And there are lots of strategies besides what you've mentioned. That There's a qualified personal residence trust or QPERT to be short. There's family limited partnerships. There's, there's charitable lead trusts. There's charitable remainder trusts. Uh, there is the state freezes. Like you just do an outright gift right now to the kids or at some point later. And so, yeah, it, it gets, it gets credited against your estate tax exemption, but it freezes the value. So any future growth is outside your estate. So yeah, there's lots you can do, but I, I guess, Joe, I agree with you. There's I wouldn't worry about it too much. At yet. 61, would you do advanced estate planning? Not with this scenario. Just, just, Unless George is in bad health. Yeah. Right. And then you might want to take a look. Okay. But it doesn't sound like he is. He's already got a $3 million second and dime policy. So what that means is that it's outside of his taxable estate. So why people set those up is that let's say George passes and then his kids are stuck with $3 million of estate tax. Right. Right. So instead of selling assets or the family farm or whatever that George has, he can use the life insurance pro proceeds to, to, to give it to Uncle Sam. Right. And so it's just using leverage and time in that the, the benefit is tax free to the kids. And it's not subject to estate tax yeah, right. because it's outside the taxable estate. Yeah. And often, like you say, it's done to pay the estate taxes. But when you can use strategies to eliminate the taxes, I even like that better. Sure. But you lose control by doing that. Well, you do. It's. I always like to say these estate planning techniques, they're, they're sort of like taking medicine. There's there's side effects. And you have to understand what those are. <laughs> there's, there's issues with every single strategy that you may not like. Right. So if you want full control, I guess the eyelid's probably the easiest. It is, yeah. Because then you maintain control of everything you have. Right. And you're just using the life insurance contract um, at, at both of you deaths yeah uh, to, to pay the heirs oh and anyway so more importantly is i like how i would have looked as a philly that, that looks cool <laughs> your money your wealth is presented by pure financial advisors click the get an assessment button in the podcast show notes at your money your wealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment video call. It does not matter where you are in the country. Chances are one of the certified financial planner professionals at Pure will be able to identify strategies to help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision.